Vicky, uh, I am Stephen Tramer. I work at AOL, which is a company that does still exist, and it produces <laughs> products other than slow dial-up. Um, it is largely a media company at this point. I work in the advertising division on their iOS ad delivery SDK. Um, I did not know that my introduction was going to be read, so I prepared this slide where I was going to tell you everything I learned about Australia was from Long Weekend. I recently ate kangaroo on my quest to eat every animal that is widely consumed in the Western world. Uh, and because this is a professional talk, uh, my professional background, I worked on some of the software that runs the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. I've worked on iOS for the last six years. Uh, I have also been a teacher, as Vicky mentioned, and I have been a humorist and games journalist. So I've done a lot of stuff. All right, uh, you don't care about any of that, that. You're here for this talk, planning migrations from Objective-C to Swift. There will be a little bit as well about migrating C, C++, other old code, um, but primarily the focus is going to be on Objective-C because as iOS and OS 10, now Mac OS, again, developers, uh, it's Objective-C. So why migrate now? Swift has been around for three years-ish at this point. It was around for a long time before that and nobody knew. Uh, and it will continue to be around for the foreseeable future. Going to take a look at the cost benefit analysis of migration very briefly. There are costs that come with it, uh, even if the benefits are fairly obvious to all of us as developers. Going to talk about top down versus bottom up migration strategies. If you are running a large project, you probably need to think about how you will actually coordinate and organize your migration, uh, which ties right into identifying the vertical slices of your product that you can migrate in those two fashions. Uh, we will discuss preparing some code for migration, and uh, if there is time, and I hope there is, we will talk a little bit about actually producing glue code that allows you to have Objective-C talk to Swift fairly painlessly. Um, the talking to is painless, not the glue code. So why migrate now to Swift 3? This talk focuses on Swift 3. Swift 3 is coming out sometime in perhaps the near future. I could not possibly guess when, perhaps sometime in September or October. Um, it is intended to be the first feature-stable release of Swift. Uh, Chris Latner, who is the Swift lead at Apple, has explicitly said that this is a primary goal of Swift 3. They've tried to remove syntax that they no longer want in the language, and while they may add features in the future, it will only be additions. Additions tend to not affect your code other than making you wish that you could use the additions. Um, <clears throat> the Swift API design guidelines are now locked down. There is an official document on swift.org that tells you how to design and name Swift APIs. This is a huge deal because for a very long time, Apple has published the Objective-C API design guidelines. Now there are Swift API design guidelines. Swift and Objective-C talk to each other very well when your code follows both of those guidelines. The language is now robust enough to support migration. Swift has not always been great. Swift 1 was actually very bad. Swift 2 is better, but I'm not very happy with it. Uh, and then the last one, which we all know, uh, project managers may not know this, developers would probably like to migrate. If you're in this talk, it's probably because you want to do this or you want your employees to do this. Um, you always want to work with the latest and greatest newest thing, and Swift happens to be very good at what it does, which is a applications programming language. Fantastic. So, cost benefit analysis of migrating. What are the current costs of migrating? Swift still lacks critical features for full stability. Generics are not fully stabilized. There is no stable ABI, application binary interface. The ways in which Swift makes calls at an actual system level are basically guaranteed to change. This is why you cannot compile static libraries with Swift, and it is also why there is an enormous binary size when you ship Swift. I believe that it adds five megabytes to your overall shipped binary because it cannot statically link, it cannot dynamically link, it can only link against the libraries that your code was explicitly built with because there's no stable ABI. So that's definitely a cost. Um, 
One of the things that happens with SDKs quite frequently for apps, this is a little less of a problem. Developers complain a lot when your product is over a few hundred kilobytes. Uh, there is still a learning curve to Swift. Swift is fairly easy to learn, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a learning curve. You're gonna have to do source code analysis to prepare for your migration. That's what we're going to talk about for about half of this talk, probably a little bit more. And you also have to prepare the source code after you analyze it. There are features of Objective-C that showed up a couple of years ago and a little bit into the future, features like Objective-C generics, NS enum, uh, certain type defs and attribute properties. You want to prepare your existing source base for migration, 100% of it. You don't have to do it all at once, but you do have to do it. Uh, and then there is also the aforementioned producing glue code. Glue code is something that developers do not like. It is boring to write. It is large and it is designed to be thrown away as quickly as possible, which means that if you are writing glue code, which you will have to do in a migration of some type, you're producing work that will go away. People do not want to do that. All right, benefits. Well, a lot of people have been talking about Swift at this conference. You are presumably all iOS developers who are at least moderately familiar with Swift. It has a very robust type system. Swift's type system is great. Uh, type checking is something very important. Objective-C programmers do not really have access to a type system and it leads to sort of a Stockholm syndrome where we think that that's okay. It is not okay when everything is a void pointer. Um, supports functional programming. Functional programming is the new hotness. A lot of developers enjoy functional programming and would like to be doing more of it. Functional programming is also an excellent programming strategy to solve many data analysis and uh, processing problems, which more and more apps are doing. So, safety. Swift is immutable by default. It wants you to engage in those functional programming practices of, I have an object and it never mutates, but I use it to construct new objects. We are now in a period of time where safety is very important and memory and processor speed tend to not be very expensive, even on mobile devices. So, safety, very important. I also mentioned speed. Swift is a language that is highly optimized in specific ways to give you very good speed and even low memory footprints sometimes. These are, again, important for mobile devices, despite the fact that they are getting increasingly more powerful with every year and uh, presumably again next week. And the last thing uh, about Swift that is great is it now has an open language development and evolution process. Apple open sourced Swift with Swift 2. Swift 3 has largely been community driven, which is fantastic. Uh, Swift 3, I think, had something like 50 accepted community proposals that made it into the language, which varied from compatibility features to removing syntax to adding syntax to suggestions for how to handle generics, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it's actually fairly easy to participate in this process as well. They want people to fix compiler bugs. They want people to get involved in the development and evolution process. If you are interested in compilers, this is great. Uh, and the last one, developers will love you if you migrate. Pretty obvious, we're developers. All right, top down and bottom up, migrations. The two general migration strategies. Top down migrations are what most of you will be doing. You start at a top layer. Top-down migrations start with the UI or the API. Bottom-up migrations start with a core functionality of your product. Normally this is a core library that it integrates. This could be a very low level networking library that you've perhaps developed or used. It could be some critical feature that is used by all parts of your app. It could just be a set of utility functions. It can be anything as long as it's commonly shared. So we're gonna look at this highly arbitrary uh, graph that I made of a project. Uh, if I can move the little pointer over here. All right, we've got a UI layer. We have what's called layer one, layer two, layer three, and core functionality. So top-down migrations, start here, up at the very top. You don't really need to write glue code. Swift is excellent at calling Objective-C code. It is designed to call Objective-C code because it needs those Objective-C libraries to work. 
It is best for UI stable or API unstable products. If you are developing an app, that app has a pretty heavily locked down UI, or you have explicitly said uh, the names of these API functions that we're offering you from our library are not guaranteed to remain those names for a very long time. This is a good strategy for you. Uh, it's great for highly segmented UI. Uh, when we talk about vertical slices, that means that you can do your UI, your controller, your model, everything. You can just do them as individual slices rather than doing a whole bunch of stuff across the border. Uh, it's also great for apps that have very simple UI. If you just have like a table view, like for example, the DevWorld app, this would be great. Bottom of migration, uh, glue code may be necessary. You'll notice that there's a little box down here that says glue code that has to be called through to get to the core functionality layer from Objective-C. This is best for projects that have a monolithic UI, by which I mean a very large, complicated UI that is perhaps poorly designed and managed by one or two classes. There are apps like that. We have probably all seen them. Uh, required API stability. If you are working on an SDK or a library, you probably have required API stability. If you want to migrate to Swift, well, not only do you have to wait for a stable ABI, you will probably need to do a bottom-up migration. Um, and then the last one is most important, that there is an easily isolated core library for you to work from. Bottom-up migration is not going to work very well if you have to do components kind of piecemeal and those components are all calling each other all over the place because the more calls that you have from Objective-C to Swift and you are doing this sort of migration, the more glue code you write, the more work is eventually wasted and the more you have to throw away in the end. So, vertical slices. Normally you want to break migration out into even smaller pieces than what just showed up on that diagram. So, vertical slice. This is a very common term in the game industry um, and in certain types of project management or prototyping. Essentially what it means is you have a easily identifiable segment of your product that is a concrete vertical slice, top to bottom. It offers a specific set of functionality that you can demonstrate. It is essentially its own product. Your big product is made up of a lot of small products. Like for example, here, vertical slices. We have one vertical slice right here, which is the UIA calling into the layer one component A. This is probably a complete product. What that means is we can actually migrate this as one individual product. You could do this either top down or bottom up. It probably will work great either way, but the obvious thing is top down. And then additionally out of that, well, layer one calls into layer two, so when this is in Swift and it calls down to Objective-C, great, that's easy. Here's another one. Two UI components that call into a core library. This is a good candidate for a bottom-up migration. There is core functionality here that is used by higher level classes. Um, if you wanted to do these higher level classes individually though, there are only two of them, you can also do that. Now there's the more complicated ones. This is also a vertical slice. It is a vertical slice that describes an entirely different core library than you perhaps have identified. Because this, all of these components in layer three call into the core functionality, which technically means they are the core functionality. But it also means that you can do a piecemeal top-down migration here. Layer three, component A, component B, component C, and then the core. The only thing that you have to worry about now is the fact that layer two calls layer three. So you actually would have to write some glue code in this little region right here, which uh, I did not draw on the diagram, and I apologize for that. <coughs> Similarly, you can do this. Layer three is a core library. You can treat it as a core library, and you can treat layer two here as though it is the API to that core library. So. There's lots of different ways to slice up this crazy example project that I cooked up out of nowhere and is certainly not based on source code I'm not allowed to show you. So how do I identify vertical slices? It's great if we just have, you know, those, how many classes were on there? One, two, three, four, seven, eight-ish classes, maybe. Um, but our real products are not like that. They have 
tens of classes, if we're unfortunate, hundreds of classes. Um, there's a wonderful tool for doing include graph analysis called obcdep. What this does is it crawls through your source code. It looks at include statements, pound include statements. It does not look at imports. This is very important. It's an uh, issue with the fact that this is several years old. Um, and it generates a dot file, which you can look at in OmniGraphle. You can look at it through GraphBiz tools, whatever you would like. Um, it does, however, only tell you part of the story. It's, it's an include graph. It doesn't tell you what is used. It doesn't tell you where it's used. It doesn't tell you if it's used. <laughs> Includes have a habit of sticking around even when we are no longer using the code that is associated with them. So here's a case study. Here is a graph that is, again, uh, definitely not from proprietary source code that had everything renamed in it. Um, so I actually colored this little red box here in the middle so it's easy to identify, but here is where we would want to start the migration, a root class. It calls out to a whole bunch of different things in this diagram. Uh, and this is what's called a force-directed diagram. It's a little difficult to read. Um, here's one that's easier to read. <laughs> which sounds ridiculous because it is so tiny, but it is actually a left to right oriented include graph, which means that as we progress from the root class here to the right of the diagram, what you actually find out is which classes are potentially calling what, and that makes it easier to identify those layers in the diagram to determine your vertical slices. Again, include graphs are not the whole story. Call graphs give you a much better idea of what's going on. Call graphs are exactly what they sound like. It's a call graph, which functions, call which functions, and it generates an entire tree of them, and you can look at them. Um, LLVM can do this for you, the compiler backend for Clang and also for Swift. Xcode does not ship with these tools, though, so you are going to have to install them yourself. Don't worry, we will go through the four steps to generate these graphs very soon. Um, and these graphs can be incredibly overbearing. They are enormous. Call graphs are super massive. It's not just the functions that you explicitly call, it's all of the functions that are implicitly called as well. Things like malloc, obc runtime functions, uh, string allocations. In Objective-C, if you're using blocks, every block has an associated function with it that will turn up in your call graph. All right, oh, I duplicated the slide somehow. That's very unfortunate. All right, vertical slices, call graphs. How do you generate a call graph? Brew install LLVM. If you are not using Homebrew, it is great. Do this. Clang, and then you provide files, and then you provide this very last tag at the end, emit LLVM. So those three dots in there, that's stuff that you want to get from your Xcode project. You build a source file in Xcode, um, you go to the little thing that shows you the build state. I would actually show you right now, except for my VM is updating because there was a new release of Sierra right before my talk. Um, and yeah, this list right here, the files list, this is what you get from your include graph. Your include graph will tell you which files actually matter. Those are the files you want to generate LLVM for. You link all of the LLVM files together into a single output with this command, and then you analyze it to generate a call graph. Generating a call graph is great. Uh, unfortunately, they are extremely overbearing. If you cannot read the text on here, this shot from OmniGraphle for Canvas 1 of a call graph lists pages 1 to 600. Uh, and there are 375 class nodes, or sorry, function nodes in the call graph. That's a lot. So, and most of that information is actually unsymbolicated external references. If you did not compile LLVM for some of the classes that either make calls to your functions or your functions are making calls to, they will be external references. External references don't show up on this graph. Um, or I should say they don't show up in any meaningful way on this graph, but you will still see directed lines from them to everywhere. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you that call graph because when I tried to export it from OmniGraphle, it crashed because it was so huge. Cleaning up your call graph. So you can edit dot files manually. 
It's just text. It's a great format. You can delete all references which are marked as external. External references you don't care about. Delete them. Delete runtime function call nodes. You probably do not care about when your functions are calling these because these are inserted by the compiler. Uh, and there's an excellent Python tool called NetworkX, which allows you to do graph analysis on very large dot files. I found out about this while I was researching how to slim down the call graph that I generated. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have time to actually use it, so I cannot speak to how well it manages this stuff. But it is a Python library designed for graph analysis that is used by scientists, which means it is probably pretty good. All right, let's talk about preparing for migration. Preparing for migration simply means taking your existing Objective-C code and making it look super nice and give the Swift compiler some hints so that when it sees information on your Objective-C code from the bridging header, it knows how to treat it. Nullable and non-null are pointer specifiers. They are exactly what they sound like. If something is designated as non-null, you are telling the compiler this will never be a null value. You are promising that. If you say that something is nullable, it can be null. Uh, and surprise, surprise, nullable translates to an optional in Swift, and non-null translates to a concrete type, or I should say a non-optional type. Use NSAssume non-null, begin, end. This is a macro that you can insert at the top of your header file and at the bottom of your header file, and it will assume that every pointer inside that file is a non-null pointer, which is the default behavior of Swift. Nothing is optional unless you say it's optional in Swift. This is a very useful thing to do because otherwise you're going to be writing non-null all over the place. Um, because most of the time when we write code, we do not expect to return nil from anywhere. Objective-C got generic support last year, finally. People have de been demanding this for years. Um, unfortunately, generics are mostly annotations that are quasi-useful to the compiler, and the only real reason they exist is for Swift compatibility. So, use generics. All right, enums. We use them in source code. We use them to designate a list of options normally. Well, you should be declaring them with NSEnum and NSOptions. NSEnum is for enumerations. NSOptions is essentially for a set of options that you treat as bit flags. I wish they called it NSBitFlag, but there you go. These macros take a type, a name, and then you name the elements of it in a particular fashion. Here's an example from our SDK. Um, NS enum, you provide it with a type first. It will normally be NS integer, but you can make it whatever you want as long as it is an integer type. Uh, then you give it a name. In this case, it is add size. And that name is what all of your enum element names will start with. And then that last word there is the word that designates what the enum will be in Swift. So, this defines in Swift an enumeration type called mm inline add size with cases banner, large banner, medium rectangle, full banner, leaderboard, and flexible. Options is very similar, except for you probably actually want to follow the bit flag values. Um, the reason that you do this is in Swift, I believe that what it does is it actually generates some additional type information or conforms to a protocol I haven't exactly checked that allows you to do traditional bit flag operations on these such as combining them. So there was a talk the other day about somebody who wrapped an entire C library for use in Swift. I regret to inform him that all of his work is useless in Swift 3 because of this. Um, there is a new attribute provided by Swift 3, I should say by Clang, to be compatible with Swift 3, where you provide an actual name that your C function gets in Swift. It is correctly namespaced. It treats things as objects. It's fantastic. Um, 
All it is, attribute swift name, provide it with a swift name. Uh, if you provide an argument called self, it is considered to be a method. If you do not provide that, it is considered to be a class function, a static method. But this is not required. And the full description is in Swift Evolution 0044. This is a document on the Swift Evolution Git repo, which there will be a link to at the very end. All right, next thing that you wanna migrate, extern const. Extern const is a series of extern const. They can be enumerated. So this is stuff like string values that in C you can't place into an enumeration because it's a string value, but they're all associated together. And well, with Swift 3, there is now a way to declare these extern consts as a type. You can declare them as an aggregate type, much like how NSENUM works. Explicitly, you type def, you have a type, give it a new name. Uh, the type there, by the way, is the type of your constants. Attribute, it's a Swift wrapper. It's either a struct or an enum. There's different uses for each. And then you give them some values. Uh, struct for extensible enumerations and enum for non-extensible enumerations. The examples that are used are uh, error codes and like a specific, or error domains and I think like a specific set of um, features. This is described in SE0033. These documents are great and incredibly comprehensive. It's where I took most of the examples from. All right, errors. Go through this really quick because NS error enum. It looks exactly like NS enum except for you also provide a domain. SE0112 fully describes this. Uh, but it is maybe not implemented yet because when I tried to do it, it didn't work. <laughs> All right, probably got like five minutes, so I think that I can go through glue code real quick. Um, Top-down glue code covered by Swift being able to call into objective state. They took care of this for you. The at obc annotation, that's what we're talking about. Bottom-up glue code, well, at obc, that works fine. That's how objective C calls into Swift. You've probably seen it if you've read the existing documentation on connecting Swift and objective C code. But you will need to manually wrap structs, enums that derive from a class, top level functions. These are all things you wanna be using in Swift because they're great. You cannot directly translate them to Objective-C. Here's a slide with a lot of code on it. This shows a struct in Swift and the accompanying glue code that I had to write for it. There's a wrapper, there's an initialization function, there's two of them actually. One of them is for Objective-C, one of them is for locality. Functions that wrap and unwrap the location between a Swift location and an Objective-C location wrapper. Um, and then Swift does not have dynamic function dispatch yet. Well, explicit introspective dynamic function dispatch. So you have to manually wrap every individual function. Tuples. These are very easy. A tuple is just contiguous data. Uh, in C, you declare it as a C struct. Um, it's contiguous data, it's a C struct. Uh, and then in Swift, you provide a function to wrap it because a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a tuple is not what Swift calls a nominal type, so you cannot provide it with an extension. However, you will notice there, extension coordinate wrapper. Uh, C structs in Swift are treated as Swift structs, which means you can extend them and put functions on them, and it works great. Algebraic enumerations. Um, algebraic types, enums with associated values, whatever you want to call them. Uh, here's a relatively simple one. Here is the C code. I'm going to break this into two slides because the Swift code is very large. Um, you enumerate what each of the tags are. By the way, I found out those tags by inspecting the results of the compiler. So you do actually have to do some work to generate this outside of just thinking about it. Um, and then if you've been a C programmer for a very long time, you probably know what a tag union is, which is what C++ classes were back in the very old days. It is a union, which is a singled value data size type. 
uh, that has a tag associated with it that tells you what value to read out of the union. Again, Swift treats enumerations as contiguous data, it turns out. Here is the code for handling this contiguous data. Again, we get to extend position locally. We wrap it. The wrapper code here is more complicated because we have to deal with the enumeration and individual tagging. Um, the tags are of different types, so you can't easily translate between them, unfortunately. Unwrapping is very similar, except for you can actually just do it in a switch, and then because of the convenience initializers made from Swift, just pass the associated value back. It's great. However, this comes with an extreme warning. You can't direct map enums all the time because Custom Swift LLVM has some features that they say are good. Here, here's an example of a function that you can direct map. It returns a position. That little enum that I just showed that has three different types, three different associated values. If we turn it into an optional, it is no longer okay. Remember, optionals are just enumerations. Syntax sugar. This is a really a type of optional position. Uh, so what the compiler does is the second example optimizes to use a scratch register which violates system V calling conventions, which means that you cannot directly map the return value to a C type, and that is bad. So you actually have to inspect the results of the compiler to figure out whether or not you can even do these things. Last type of glue toad, top level functions. Well, a top level function, you cannot call it directly from Objective-C, unfortunately. But you can wrap it in a class accessible from Objective-C, and you can declare it a static function on that class, so now you can call it. Um, by the way, throws keyword here. Normally, that is automatically translated by Swift into this extra error here, the NS error pointer, the traditional <coughs> way in which we catch errors in Objective-C, the error pointer pointer. Um, however, I found a bug in the Swift compiler. There's a compiler bug here because we are actually returning a C struct and it doesn't know what the hell to do, so it blows up and doesn't compile it. Now, let's talk very briefly about how I figured all of this stuff out because I mentioned you have to inspect compiler output. Swift C emit SIL, IR, or assembly. It turns out there are two different intermediate stages for Swift, and there's an assembly stage. The first intermediate stage is called Swift Intermediate Language. Second one is LLVMIR, which maybe you have heard about at some point. And the final stage is assembly in whatever target you're compiling for. So in Swift, let's say that we have our midpoint function that no longer throws anything because uh, throwing things really screw stuff up. In Swift intermediate language, we get the mangled function name and we actually get some additional information about the types that are taken and returned by it. Very useful. LLVMIR, even better. It tells us the size and type. Int64, int2, and double. Okay, int2, it's really just a UN8T. That's what it compiles down to because everything is one byte aligned on modern processors. Although LLVM does not treat things that way because sometimes it doesn't compile for modern processors. All right, in closing, great time to migrate. Use your source tree to identify those vertical slices. Use obcdep to get the include graph. Use LLVM to get your function call graph. Determine how to approach each slice. Once you have your slices, actually look at the resulting tree of where your code is going and figure out the best strategy for approaching it. Write glue code if you have to. You're gonna throw it away, but you're gonna have to do it. Do it. Um, and then get involved in the actual Swift evolution process if you want the migration tools to get better. There's absolutely no reason why structs could not be directly wrapped there's no reason why enums couldn't be directly wrapped. It's just the Swift team hasn't chosen to do it yet because there's not a good proposal for doing so yet. Last slide. Uh, I gave a talk at this time last week that is much more in depth about all of this process. 
You can read the Swift Evolution documents. Uh, please give me feedback on this talk. I would greatly appreciate it. I speak at conferences quite a bit, and I like to get better at it. Thank <laughs> you.